I want to welcome all of you here to today's Rosenmeyer Forum. And you will find uh, this forum to be very, very informative and interesting. I had the privilege last night in Nisswa, Minnesota, of hearing our two guests speak. And it was one of the best Rosenmeyer Forums that our college has ever put together. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, I want to introduce to you the, one of the best community college presidents Central Lakes College has ever had and is the greatest community college president of any college in the state of Minnesota, of any community college, Dr. Hera Charlier. Hera, take a bow. And Hera, it's not only my view when I say that, it's everybody's, students and faculty alike. I also want to, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my friend of long, long standing, former United States Congressman Rick Nolan. When I was a senior in college, I managed Rick Nolan's campaign for the Minnesota House of Representatives, and he won in a landslide. And uh, four years later, I succeeded him when he ran for the Congress of the United States. Rick Nolan is without question the best retail politician in Minnesota since Hubert Humphrey. He makes you feel right at home, and when he visits with you and campaigns, it's like he's known you for 50 years even if you are meeting him for the first time. Let's give Rick Nolan, a great congressman and public servant, a big hand. I deem it a high honor to introduce to you today the, the Rosenmeyer Center's two speakers who will discuss their book, When Republicans Were Progressive, and they will discuss some of the history of Minnesota's Republican Party. The first author and speaker I am introducing is Lori Sturdivant, a longtime respected journalist and columnist for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Lori Sturdivant covered the state legislature and state politics and elections from the mid-1970s until just very recently when she retired. I can remember Lori's diligence and dedication in covering the legislature in virtually every session. Uh, she was there daily because I would always see her in the press, alco press alcove in the back of the House chamber. Lori was always a very capable reporter whose articles on politics, I thought, always provided the what I call the subtleties and nuances behind what was happening in the legislature and in election campaigns in Minnesota politics. Lori Sturdivant has authored and elected and edited books that about notable Minnesotans, including a great autobiography of Governor Elmer L. Anderson. Also tonight, the Rosenmeyer Center is greatly honored to have as our speaker, our former United States Senator Dave Dernberger, a son of Stearns County and St. John's University, which is located in the heartland of Minnesota. Dave Dernberger was elected to the Minnesota Senate, to the United States Senate from Minnesota uh, in 1978. I neglected to mention he's also a graduate of both St. John's University and the University of Minnesota Law School. He served as executive secretary, which would be today the role of chief of staff, to Governor Harold Levander from 1967 to 1971. And I am absolutely certain, as I said last night, that Mr. Dernberger would have worked closely with the late, great Senator Gordon Rosenmeyer in the last legislative sessions that he served in, which was in the 1967 and 1969 legislative sessions. As I mentioned, Dave was elected to the United States Senate in 1978, filling the unfilled seat of the late great Senator Hubert H. Humphrey. He was re-elected in, in 1982, and then was re-elected again in 1988. He was one of the first Republicans in modern Minnesota history to be elected three times to the United States Senate. I mentioned last night the fact, I remember in 1978, I was campaigning in, a, in the Onamia Cafe, and I, I noticed when I came in to hand out my cards to people, which is the way I campaigned for state legislature, in there was uh, a gracious lady handing out her cards, and she introduced herself to me as she was handing out cards for her son, Dave, who was running for the United States Senate. 
And then she said, Mr. Wenzel, she said, I want you to vote for my son. And of course, I told her I would. And I, the more I thought about it, Dave, I, I think you were the first Republican I ever voted for. Now, I, <laughs> now I have voted for Republicans, some Republicans, since that time. But uh, Senator Dernberger, after he left the Senate, became what I would call an expert on health care legislation reform. And he was able to be, he is able to talk knowledgeably about health care reform because he served as chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on F Health Care Finance. He also served as chairman of the Senate Committee on Intelligence, which keeps, that's the committee that keeps all of the nation's top secrets. And he, in that position, carried out his responsibilities with great care and dedication and probity. With no further ado, it's my great privilege and honor to introduce to you former Senator David Dernberger and Lori Sturdivant as our speakers today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Representative Wenzel. You'll always be Representative Wenzel to me, despite your many other titles in the years since you've left the legislature. And let me assure you, you were not the only DFLer who voted for Dave Dernberger in 1978 after Bob Short won that Short Fraser primary that year. I think in the city of Minneapolis, there were quite a few DFLers who said, let's take a look at this Dernberger guy. So it's a real treat to be in Brainerd and at this lovely facility here at Central Lakes. Uh, and what, what wonderful host you are. Thank you so much for coming today. It's a, a great opportunity for us to talk about what I still think of as the, the biggest story of my 40 plus years of covering Minnesota politics. The change in the Republican Party has been dramatic in this state. Oh, surely the DFL has changed too and lots of other things demographically, economically have changed in Minnesota. But you know, the, 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 this dramatic difference in the Republican Party that I first covered, which was in 1978, my first election, the, ele uh, the election that Dave Dernberger won uh, the U.S. Senate seat that year, uh, the, the change from that point till now is uh, uh, hard to fathom sometimes. And so we try to fathom it in this book, When Republicans Were Progressive. How about it? Did you know the great Gordon Rosenmeyer in the 1960s when you were the chief of staff for Harold Devander? Uh, sure. I. But I knew Gordon Rosemeyer by reputation because I was, um, I worked for Harold Evander as a brand new young lawyer. I got enlisted into his campaign in 1965 when he was running for governor. I ended up with uh, three opponents, Elmer Anderson, Bill Randall, a county attorney in, in Ramsey County who had won a fantastically famous case, and then um, John Pillsbury, who represented sort of like the young Turk, the Republicans and so forth. But um, I must say I was not steeped. Uh, I had a political science degree and a history degree and an English minor, something like that, from St. John's, which is the most famous school in the Holy Land, um, <laughs> which many of you will understand is sort of like the German, Polish, Catholic center of uh, Minnesota, where they're most famous, not for St. John's, but for Minnesota 13, which is, uh, for you younger persons, is a uh, prohibition uh, liquor that was known all over the world. And it came from Holding Ford and Avon Townships in the heart of the Holy Land. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Gordon, Gordon was like an icon, I guess, because um, he was so far ahead of his time, he wouldn't identify as a Republican or a Democrat when we came on board. We had a two-thirds conservative house, almost two-thirds conservative, as they were called, um, uh, Senate in 1967, but it was clear that Gordon Rosemeyer was the one person that counted on, on both sides of the aisle as well as both in the House and the Senate. Why was that? Because he was a progressive, and a progressive in the sense that he was uh, mature enough, self-confident enough, smart enough, and dedicated enough to know that Minnesota was changing from the Minnesota that the Republican conservatives sort of ran for a good part of uh, our, our history, it was beginning to change, starting with Harold Sasson and, and onward through what we call, in our book, progressive Republicans. But Gordon sensed that. And he sensed that 
parallel with that was a change in the economy in the state and in the country and in the world, and a change in where people decided to live. People began to move out of the inner city and create things out of, t convert townships into cities, and things like this were going on. And Gordon was smart enough to watch all of this evolve and say, we're not well enough prepared to define what should the role of government be in making all that happen. And um, that, was his, that was his genius, and he created this commission, and a commission had other House members and other senators on it, but it was pretty clear that he and his staff assistant, Bob Edmond, sort of ran the thing. So the order from everybody on the legislative side when I was this 32-year-old chief of staff to the governor was be sure you listen to Gordon. Yeah. And I'll never regret having done that. Yeah, well, Gordon understood uh, uh, that the government had a role to play in solving society's problems, a more vigorous role, perhaps, than would have been seen by the Republicans who preceded him and preceded Harold Stassen. And that's, that change that from 1938, the election of Harold Stassen forward, is the story, the arc that we try to describe in this book. Uh, people ask us, why is the title, when Republicans were progressive, since that word is today associated with the most liberal wing of the, D of the Democratic Party nationally? But in, it has a, uh, that word has a rich history, and it punches my history buttons that the publisher suggested we use that title. Because it traces from the progressive movement that existed within the Republican Party in the early 20th century, about 110, 120 years ago. That was a, a movement that was a, a response to the Gilded Age of its time, a sense that there needed to be more power in the hands of the people, not the oligarchs. And their uh, ideas included such things as, uh, as primary elections rather than uh, candidates being handpicked by a, a, a small select few, things like uh, initiative and referendum and recall, things like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the income tax were progressive Republican ideas in those years. Uh, Republican ideas were very, th those were progressive ideas were very popular in the Midwest. Robert La Follette of Wisconsin was a great exponent of, of those things. So was Theodore Roosevelt, who when he ran in the 1912 as a third party presidential candidate, called himself a, openly a progressive Republican. He carried six states as a third party candidate that year, and Minnesota was one of them. But his ideas don't really catch on at the state level until Harold Sasson bursts on the scene in 1938. Dave, I think you were a four-year-old that year. Yes, and, and, and but it, I was he, precocious. Yes, yes. Well, but you, but you grew up hearing about and admiring Harold Sasson and his kind of politics because of the impact he had throughout the state. You can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, you're growing up, and I'm growing up on a college campus. My dad has been the coach at St. John's since he graduated. Um, in 1928, he'd been the athletic director since 1930 on, and he kind of like knew everybody, including Fred Hughes, uh, the, the best known Republican and a progressive Republican in St. Cloud, and Fred's good friend and my dad's good friend, Lawrence Duck Hall, who was the Democratic or, or liberal uh, speaker of the House of Representatives in the, at the time Stassen ran. And so I got my taste as a little boy <laughs> becoming, uh, getting to the age of reason and ration, you know, rational behavior even, um, at a young age, I grew up around my parents' friends and, and um, their views and their opinions about, about uh, the, the meaning of politics. What, what does it really mean? And it isn't like all Republican or Democrat, which are the traditional two parties, and and of course, as I'm growing up, there's still a Democratic Party and a Farmer Labor Party. They haven't been united until I'm 10 years old. But, but uh, the reality is, each of us is shaped by our environment. And my environment is, is this little Flynn town, a bunch of houses on the campus of St. John's. And the nearest uh, towns are Avon, four miles one way, and St. Joe, four miles the other way, and St. Cloud, and, and the people that are my, my parents' friends and so forth, and I don't have the advantage that people have today of getting a variety of opinions <laughs> and or a little bit of history and the contours of history that are shaped by public opinion media <laughs> today. Um, I knew it as, as people. You know, I knew that my parents thought it was just awful that a Johnny by the name of Gene McCarthy should run for the House of Representatives in the St. Paul in the 4th Congressional District against another Johnny, Ed Devitt, 
who was a Republican and had the seat from 1946 to 48. And McCarthy has the nerve, and I remember that. And yet I also remember McCarthy visiting at my parents' home or their lake home all the time, and they're sitting around having a few bumps and playing bridge and all the rest of that sort of thing. You know, basically, Laurie and, and all of you, that's who we are. That's Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I, might say, I might say, you know, Holy Land, and, you know, you say what you say about, you know, your lake country and things like that. Um, but we don't lose the essence of who we are as a state. We don't. We, we carry a lot of not so good things. My mother's already been referred to. I remember my mother's prejudices. I remember her prejudices against Jewish people, which Minnesota is famous for. I mean, we were the last to take down the barriers to Jewish people in this state, to say nothing of, quote, color, that sort of thing. And those prejudices were brought over here from the old country, and they thrived in our various little communities. As the older people know, there used to be the Polish church on one end of town and the German church on the other end, or the Irish church, or whatever it happened to be. St. Paul used to be a German city, now it's an Irish city. God knows what it is. It's probably now a city for absolutely everybody. <laughs> but it's, but we have always had the ability, and I think it's because of who we are, where we are, we've always had the ability to adjust to change. Well, and I would submit, Dave, that the uh, progressive Republican Party that we write about was very instrumental in pushing Minnesota's 20th century changes in that more positive, more inclusive, more forward-looking direction. Harold Stassen represented quite a break with the previous Republicans. He actually supported labor unions and wanted them to flourish without a lot of strikes, so he wanted to improve labor laws. He wasn't against FDR's New Deal. He wanted to improve it and perfect it, and you did wanted to use professional as professionalized state employees rather than the, the cronyism that had pervaded the, the farmer labor governors that had preceded him. Uh, he was an internationalist and wanted to put aside the isolationism that had infected a lot of Minnesotans thinking uh, before that. So he pushes along a change. Then comes in the, the 50s and 60s, Elmer Anderson, a good friend of, of both of yours and mine, who was a big advocate for civil rights. Uh, and then in uh, that wonderful 1967 legislative session where you're the young chief of staff, Harold Evander is the new governor, and Republicans control the entire Minnesota legislature, we have a flourish of, of really progressive legislation. I'll just rattle through a few of them and then you can comment on those years and what it was like to work for Harold Levander. But in the 1967 legislative session, the, the Republican legislature created the first Minnesota sales tax, three cents, created that over the objection of the governor, but he didn't object to the fact that we were raising taxes. He objected that we didn't first take it to a referendum as he had promised the voters he would want to do in, in the 1966 election. That, so it, th this was not a no new taxes party. It was a, a party that raised taxes for the sake of education primarily, also for the sake of the expansion of the higher education system, and I think this institution was probably one of the beneficiaries of that new taxes, tax revenue. This same legislative session created the Pollution Control Agency, strong force to use the, the muscle of government to tamp down on pollution, and the beginning of the concerns of, about climate change can be traced to that era um, in the 1960s created the State Department of Human Rights. These are people who were strong for human rights and wanted to use government to advance the, the, the tearing down of discrimination, which had been, as Dave cites, a problem in Minnesota. They created the Metropolitan Council, which today a lot of Republican legislators decry as a overreach of government. In fact, then it was a, a, a just a, it was a tool to solve problems. And it was an innovative tool created with a lot of collaboration with the Citizens League and other grassroots organizations an innovative approach to try to collaborate uh, and, and use our resources more wisely as the metropolitan area grew. Oh, this was a metropolitan or an urban party. It wasn't just a, an outstate party as we see now with the big rural urban divide that has developed. So this was quite a different party, and you, Dave, were right in the thick of it at the, in the governor's office in those years. Yeah, and, and I, for the uh, students in the room and the younger people in the room, um, I, I think it's important to catch a couple things in what Lori said. Uh, it looks like we invented a whole lot of government on our, <laughs> on our watch. But if you look at each of these closely, one of them, like both the Pollution Control Agency and the first State Department of Human Rights in the country, was a message to the nation. You know, 
why as a nation are we lagging behind on human rights, on gender equity as well as racial equity and religious, and, and you, you can go on and on and on. Why, why, why? So we're going to start something here at the, at the state level, and the same thing was true with the Pollution Control Agency. On others, it was, hey, you guys in Washington, you know, some things are better left to the states, both to design and to implement, or if there's a national design, let us figure out how to implement it and whether we should do it at the state level, the local level, or some combination of each. But one of the functions of the national legislature really is the efficiency of tax collection. And whether it's an income tax or it's a sales tax, uh, which we don't really have at the national level yet, except for the gas tax, I guess. Um, the national government is a more efficient collector of revenue than we are at the state level. So think about it, you national folks. At what le level do you actually put all this money into some program you've created? Or uh, should you be devolving, my favorite currently, is the gas tax, you know? Even Amy says we ought to have a new, get big new gas tax, federal tax, and blah, 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 blah. I say, okay, you can keep a couple pennies off of that, but send the rest back to the states. I hung up a whole legislative session in 1982 just on that issue. You get to keep three cents of the federal gas tax, but send all the rest back to the states. Are we incapable of making decisions about <laughs> transportation? You know, and it'll be different in St. Paul, Minneapolis, from the burbs, from the rural areas, and so forth. So that's the way Republicans think, and, and that's why we get called progressive. And the other one I want to mention, of course, is because it's Brainerd. Yes. Number one, Harold Stassen leads the, after they signed the treaty to end the Second World War in Japan and Tokyo Harbor, within a week, Harold Stassen is up in a prison camp outside Tokyo and is freeing a whole bunch of Brainerd folks who are down in Bataan in the Philippine Islands. That's the one number one. Number two is the Crusade for Forgotten Souls. One of the ten, quote, mental asylums in, in Minnesota has been in Brainerd. Okay, and my wife is just, Susan Bartlett Foote, is just, uh, not just, but sometime last year, uh, wrote this book on the crusade for forgotten souls. And it's the story of how Luther Youngdahl had his mind changed <laughs> uh, from what the bureaucrats were telling him so that he endorsed, with the help of people all over this state, including Crow Wing County, a system of caring for people who couldn't find another way to care for themselves, whether it's elderly, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's people who are mentally ill, whether it's people that their, fa their families just want to kicked out of the house because they got pregnant when they were teenagers or something like that. That's the, the story of those asylums. It's all about unwanted people and about a forgiving society making the decision in 1949 to change all of that. And it's a, it's a, it's, I only mention this because it's, a, it's, it's Brainerd oriented. But well, go ahead and give a good plug. This book is up, uh, uh, Susan's book is up for a Minnesota Book Award tomorrow night at, in St. Paul. And Dave and I will both be there to cheer for her as she wins that award, I have no doubt. This is an excellent book that she has written. You mentioned uh, the willingness of Minnesotans to be nation leading when it came to policies like uh, pollution control. And, and certainly with the Met Council, that was true as well. But, but there was something else that I think is well worth lifting up. Uh, uh, there was a, a willingness to be independent from the national party. And, and that was true in both the DFL, which with, with by its very name stood apart from the Democratic Party nationally. And it was true of the Republican Party, which uh, after Watergate was so appalled uh, by what had, had happened during the Nixon years and so concerned that it wanted to uh, put some political distance between itself and, and the national scene, that it took a, a new name, the Independent Republicans. Steve remembers that name being the, the, the common, the, the IR caucuses in the Minnesota legislature. That name prevailed for 20 years. It was torn down in 1980, uh, 1995. And that's kind of the end of the arc of our story. 
uh, during those uh, the last uh, bunch of those years, Dave, you were serving in the U.S. Senate, and you had a goal, I know, of bringing some of the progressive Republican ideas of Minnesota to the national scene. And you, I would have to say you had some success, and then by the end, some pretty bad disappointments, too. Talk a little bit about your Senate yeah, career. Yeah, there's a good part of the book is not more. There's three chapters, I think, on my on my three terms, and I hope you find it interesting because I had the the, you know, the great blessing to serve two years under Jimmy Carter and Fritz Mondale, four, uh, two terms or eight years under Ronald Reagan and George Bush uh, uh, 41, and then four years under Bush 41 and two years under Bill Clinton. So I sort of got the sweep of, of uh, recent history from the post-Nixon era, if you will, in which 57 new United States senators were elected in three straight elections. And in 1978, I happened to be first of, of 19 new ones, and I got the first seat on the Senate Finance Committee, and I remember to this day my job description I got from Russell Long, who was chairman of the Finance Committee, and I asked him, why did you write me a letter, handwritten letter, about the relationship between Louisiana and Minnesota going back to 1803? What was 1803? Louisiana Purchase. Yeah, the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. Um, and he said, because President Carter wants us to raise the gas tax uh, on the high, the gas prices were going through the roof in 1979. He wants us to tax some of that and send it back to states for poor people who can't afford home heating oil, for example, things like that. And I said, yes, uh, what's that got to do with anything? And he said, well, <laughs> um, all you need to know is that what we do in Louisiana, my constituents do, is produce the stuff, oil and gas. What yours do is burn it. <laughs> and so I look at him, you know, like, oh, God. And he sees the expression on my face, and he says, you're lucky. You're lucky the Founding Fathers anticipated this problem because they came from, you know, there were 13 colonies, and at least 11 of those came from someplace in England, but for different reasons. It was the British Isles. For different reasons. Some of them wanted to bring slaves over or, or come over and utilize the African-American slaves to raise tobacco. Some of them came around because they had a lot of money and they wanted to run plantations in Virginia. Some of them came because they were Catholic, they went to Maryland. Some of them were free thinkers and they went to Massachusetts. And they said, we can't just have representative government that's where people like in the House of Representatives are up for election every two years because that'll be public opinion. So they created a Senate with two people from every state. And then he said to me what I will never forget and which you can't, you young people, can't experience because it doesn't exist in Washington today. When every state is heard from, you get good national policy. My orders were bring the best ideas of your state to Washington, D.C. That's how I got into health care. I got into education. I got into the environment. And I had a view on, on national security as well. And bring the people, you know, because Minnesotans probably have a different way of looking at some things. I always tell a story about Jim Tashney, who wrestled at St. John's, brightest guy I knew, worked for NSP, and whenever the Edison Electric Institute, the national institute representing the, uh, the electric energy industry, you know, had one position, I would call Tashney and say, what's Northern State's position? And it would be different. It would be more creative. They would be finding a better way to do things, you know, clean the air, that sort of thing. They'd find a better way of doing it. So I'd have Jim come and testify and say there's a better way. And, and on and on and on, with 17 of 54 United States senators on the Reagan watch and into the Bush watch, 17 of them being progressives or moderates because of the states they came from, with the ideas that they brought, dealing across the aisle with Democrats, we were able to accomplish, I get emotional sometimes about when I think about what Reagan and Bush are, have done because they had Howard Baker as a, as a Senate leader for four years, Bob Dole for four years, and George Mitchell for another six years when the Democrats controlled the Senate. And they all thought alike, which is it's very important that the leadership in this country come from the president, and not that the followership comes from the Senate and the House, but a lot of the ideas that need to get shaken out in this business of Louisiana versus Minnesota and you know what's the best way to get carbon 
out of the out of the air, you know, that those ideas get sifted through something that represents the entire state, or excuse me, the entire country, not the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. A marvelous learning curve from Republican in working with Democrats in that particular well, period of time. Let's mention some of those accomplishments from those years. Uh, you worked very hard on environmental protection the and the clean water, clean air legislation in the, that, that period was very strong. Uh, th we had our, our last real immigration reform happened during that period. Our last uh, real uh, entitlement reform to, to shore up the finances of Social Security and Medicare happened during that period. Uh, and, and as you point out, we, y during that period, this nation did not go to a war that it could not win. Th those are among the things that, that are, are to the credit of that period, yet at the same time you encountered more and more resistance to progressive. You say you started out with 17 uh, caucus members <laughs> in the Republican caucus that you identified as like-minded thinkers, progressive Republican thinkers. By the time you left, how many were left? Four. Four. And what happened to those four? <laughs> um, two of them became, or one of them became Democrats, two, two of them decided them. not to run for election and third one became an independent and right. one of them was taken out in a, rep in a primary right yeah. right exactly, yeah, it exactly. Became, this that was done on purpose I mean yeah. that was that was Newt Gingrich and Dick Cheney and the and the folks from the right the empower America gang they all came in in 1978 when I came in I knew them well I watched this evolve I watched the, the way in which they operated during this period of time and gradually over a period of time they began to narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow the base and then they, then they said in 1994, we got a contract with America, we're gonna do all these great things if you elect us. They elected Republicans for the majority. And what they got, the first message they, the elected people got, and Rick can, uh, can confirm this too, is leave your families at home. I brought four kids between the ages of 11 and 15 to Washington, D.C. and bought a, we had to buy a home in, you know, in McLean, Virginia and that sort of thing. And families, <laughs> I, I, story after story after story about how families uh, made this thing work, you know, this so-called bipartisan thing, whatever you want to call it. Because we all knew each other. We all lived with each other. We came from different parts of the country, too. But this, who you are as a person makes all the difference in the world. Those guys said, forget it. Forget it. Leave your families at home. We'll guarantee you, you come here on Tuesday and go home on Thursday. The rest of the time you can spend whatever you want to do, but we'd like you to raise money for this pack and that pack and this one and that and da 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 And they turned my party on its head. They had to simplify what are the issues. What, you know, what's it take to be a senator or congressman with the name Republican? Well, number one, it takes money. <laughs> number two, and the best place to get the money is from a narrowed base that you can count on. And guess what goes with that? And then there's, of course, the, the issues of the good we're there when I arrived, which is the religious right. And uh, that one we can discuss, talk, and we have a whole seminar just on, on that particular issue, the influence of, of religion on people's faith <laughs> and on the interpretation of four simple books <laughs> in what's called the New Testament in my faith, you know, in, in my religion. How do you interpret that, and how do you apply it, and how does a nation like ours apply it in a world like ours and so forth? Um, and so, but right from the get-go, starting with Jesse Helms, the senator from North Carolina, and then picked up gradually by the Republican Party as it saw some momentum in those issues, and particularly coming out of the South, uh, border states, and some of the Western states, they could feel this momentum picking up, and people were starting to, you know, not think as much about the environment, not think about equal rights, not think about a lot of those sort of things, and they began to focus on the things that are really important, and Newt Gingrich and the gang just rode that baby into the majority. And ever since then, you have had to live with that. You've had to live with those, that interpretation of what is a uh, Republican, what is a senator, what is a congressman. Uh, um, and now, when we get to the Q&A, we'll talk about how to undo that. Yes, we sure will. Well, I, as, as so many people have asked me since our book came out, what happened? Why did this progressive Republican option disappear from our ballots? And you just did a good job of detailing some of the forces that made that, uh, that uh, change happen. I, I've, I've been tr thinking about how to summarize what has happened, and I've been thinking that what, uh, one way to do so is to say that uh, for most of this country's history, uh, politics was seen as a means to an end, the end being governing. 
and politics was supposed to serve governing, not be so divisive, not so harsh, not so time-consuming or all-consuming that it got in the way of governing, but actually served to aid governing. That's the civics books lessons that we were taught years ago, those of us of a certain age, and, and th that for a long time was indeed how, uh, in a messy kind of way, how government worked. But we've kind of flipped that on its head, and now in so, for so many folks, politics is the end, not the means. Uh, there has arisen a political industrial complex in this country that makes a lot of money on keeping America divided, keeping Americans at odds with each other, keeping our politics as contentious as possible. That's certainly the story of the last 25 years, very contentious politics, but nowhere near the record of accomplishment that it, you experienced when you were in the U.S. Senate. So we lament that, and we talk about in our book how we might get a little of that back. And so we are here to invite your questions about what could, what could be done next. We have a few solutions that we advance in our book. But maybe before we get to the questions, I should read that passage that I've been reading lately because I think folks respond to it well. Right. I'll read I have just one a comment bit. I want to make after that. Sure, Short okay. One. okay, I'll read just a little bit here because it kind of summarizes where we're coming from. This book is not an exercise in nostalgia. Rather, it is written in a spirit of hope. The words, when past is prologue, are carved in stone outside the National Archives for good reason. It is common in societies for ideas to come in and out of fashion and patterns to recur. That gives us hope that the progressive Republican ideas we knew in Minnesota will come back, whether in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or some new political organization not yet named. What humans once created can be created again especially if history is available as a guide to those intent on producing positive change. This book attempts to supply some of that history. Dave, let me just start. Yeah, this is my favorite uh, quote about uh, people who you expect uh, to represent you. And it's addressed to people like me. It's not what you do, even though we write books about it. It's not what you do or what you say that best alters the lives of others, but who you are. And if you just, just think about that, I th I'm reminded of it all the time when I walk down the aisle and somebody tells me a story <laughs> about, when you tell me about 62 years at St. John's, your Uncle Chuck, God, I knew that guy like I better than I know you. <laughs> you know, and you share that with me because you know, you know who I am, and I'm not just St. John's and stuff like that, but you know I will appreciate that story. Knowing who we are is what we've lost. It's what Eric Paulson, for example, lost in the 3rd Congressional District. People knew Bill Frenzel and the congressman. People knew Jim Ramstead. But Eric was there at a time when Eric didn't get to express really who I knew Eric when he was almost like fifth, right? so the eighth grader or something like that. He didn't get to express it because he lived in the era in which you got to say only certain things and you got to certain in certain ways. Rick, tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Otherwise, you're going to get da 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 da, and don't do town hall meetings because then you're going to have to listen to a whole bunch of people rant and rave about their whichever, whatever it is and that sort of thing. How do you get to know somebody? Dean Phillips beat him. Not because Dean Phillips was a wealthy man, which he was, and he earned it himself, but because he used a different, you, you got to know who he was, who he is. He told me, and, and told my students there, 77 students, uh, master students the other day, um, I found a lot of people in my new class <laughs> in Congress in January with whom I had something in common. And it wasn't my party, it was something at work something at home, something we believed in, something in church. I don't know what it was. You know, this variety of things he said. And whether we're Republicans or Democrats, we started getting to know each other. And then we decided, hey, we ought to start meeting regularly. So we're now we're, we're meeting for one hour every week. And we even hired a staff to, <laughs> to help us have a little agenda. And they produced H.R. 1, which is the first bill to pass this, this Congress, which is all about Campaign the last board. chapter right. of our... Right. How do we fix our electoral yeah. system? And the last thing I want to say is I walked in here past the John Hassler Library. Mm -hmm. because So I got to tell you, if you turn to your right, and right in the first glass, you're going to see two pictures of Hillary. How did that happen? 
Hillary Clinton calls me up, Mrs. Clinton, I did, hadn't ever met her in February of 1993, because she's been now designated to draw up a health care bill, reform bill. So she calls me up and said, uh, uh, I'd like to get to know you better, we ought to get together and uh, you want to come down here or should I come up there? And I said, oh, I'd be glad to come down there. I just wanted to see her. Was she really at the White House? Does she have an office? You know, <laughs> stuff like this. I didn't even know who she is, really. Uh, so um, I said, well, I'd like to come down there. And she says, who's your scheduler? And I said, Julie Hassler. And she said, is she related to John? And I said, no, not to my knowledge. Why? And she said, I was in the library in, or excuse me, I was in the airport in uh, either Nashville or Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, I had some, I had layover time, and I went to the bookstore, and I just picked up this book by Hassler, and I went and I sat down, and I start reading it, and I got through the first chapter, and I went back to see if there were more Hassler books in there. And I said, well, would you like to meet him? <laughs> and she said, sure. So I called John, and Gretchen came out, you know, and I went to her office with John, and I just sat there. After the first five minutes, I didn't say a word. But I, I listened to an appreciative, a smart, appreciative reader quiz an author on, uh, you know, the, the principles in John's book. And as a result, he brought Gretchen the next time and, and that sort of thing. I, I tell you that only because you are part of, part of the John Hassler history. John Hassler is a part of, of my life history, but it is also to tell you, you know, regardless of what you think of some of these people, they're not always what you think. They're, they're much more than that. So well, Dave and I are here to attest to the goodness of Minnesotans. We know that because we've known Minnesotans, both of us, for a long time through a lot of activities. We both crave a politics that is as good as Minnesotans to come back again. Yeah. So. Re Congressman Nolan, we've got the last question. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, and, and thank you, Chief Klang. Um, <coughs> how are you, Dutch? Um, first of all, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank our panelists. Uh, Lori, um, a lifetime of work uh, sharing with us uh, your insights into our politics, our political leadership, our system has just been an invaluable contribution to our body of politic here in Minnesota and around the country, and we thank you for that. And David, um, what a pleasure and honor it was serving with you and your remarkable service in the United States Senate. And we did have the privilege of serving at a time when there was a middle and uh, there was a great deal more collaboration and people were able to work together and you and I were able to work together and pass some very important legislation of great uh, significance, improving the lives of people here in Minnesota. So um, I'm gonna say something, but first let's give them a nice applause here for their work. Uh, sitting here, I found it interesting that uh, almost all of the questions um, really surrounded the question of process. And how have we gotten to this state of hyperpartisanship, uh, gridlock, uh, unaccomplishment, um, both sides going to one extreme or, or another? And Lori, you pointed out um, in one of your uh, remarks here that the system is flawed. And Senator Dernberger, you talked about, you know, some of the problems are systematic. And um, I, I would like just take a moment to, to address that whole question. Um, you know, our framers and our founders were great students of history and politics. They devoted their lifetime to it. And as Senator Dernberger talked about, they were trying to per create as perfect a system as they could envision, as is possible. And Senator Dernberger pointed out, the idea behind the Congress of the United States was to bring people from all over the country and bring all the best minds, all the best ideas, bring them together in one place where they could be heard and where they could be just uh, debated and uh, digested and argued and debated and voted on. And that's how we found the common ground. That's how we were able to come together uh, as a nation and build the greatest nation uh, in the history of the earth. And Senator Durenberger and I had an opportunity to, to serve 
uh, during that, that time. Well, let me tell you, it has changed. That's no secret. That's the question everybody here is asking themselves. How has it changed, and what can we do about it? Let me, let me, let me tell you. Systems, process, matter. They can either bring you together, or they can divide you and tear you apart. And in my judgment, the money in politics and the process by which we govern present a very, very serious threat to the survival of our democracy. And here's what has happened now. I had the privilege of serving back in the 70s and then coming back, you know, 32 years later and say, wow, <laughs> what happened? This ain't the same place. When I had served in the 70s with David, everybody moved to Washington with their families. We went to work five days a week. There was a thing called regular order. Everything that came up came up through the committee under an open rule where everybody could offer any amendment they wanted to and have it argued, debated, and voted on. And then it came to the full house, and that was the same process. You could have it argued, debated, and voted on. And like I said, that's how you found the common ground. That's, that's where you found your differences were, but that's how you found out where you could work together, collaborate, get something done. Today, we've done the studies, we've examined them. Back in that time, 91% of everything the Congress did came through the Congress under an open rule. Today, it's less than 5%. That's right, less than 5%. And here's the drill. You, four day week, you don't have to show up on the first day till 6.30 at night. So you can spend all day doing whatever, okay? You have a few votes. And then the second day and the third day, there are no votes till one o'clock in the afternoon. They take maybe an hour. And so you got all morning free, got all afternoon free, and then at the end of the day, you have a couple of votes. All under closed rules. You brought all these people together all over the country, and they don't have an opportunity anymore to offer their ideas. Talk about health care. You mentioned any one of a number of systems. We never had a debate on one of them. When was the last time you picked up a paper or turned on the news and didn't hear about immigration? We've never had an immigration reform bill <laughs> on the House floor the last six years I served. So, what is happening? What are members doing with the rest of their time? You've got to make the connection between money and what's happening, okay? Uh, my last election contest was $25 million. Um, I, and it was the most expensive in the country. That was just eclipsed in the last election. There was one down in Georgia for $50 million. The Texas Senate race was $80 million. What has happened is members, and when we served, we didn't have Democratic and Republican call centers across the street. Now we do. And guess what? So you can take that, that first day and you can spend all day raising money. And you can take the second and the third day. You can spend the morning and the mid-afternoon raising money. You go to fundraisers in the evening raising money. And then you're out of there on the fourth day by 10 o'clock in the morning, and you can go back to raising money. Okay? So it's, we have to make that connection between the money and what that brings to the process and the regular order in the way in which our democracy has worked for hundreds of years, but no longer works. And lastly, what has the money done for us? Well, it's the big money comes in the form of independent groups. Candidates have no control over them. And most of it is money that is spent distorting the truth, denigrating the candidates. Both parties do it. Both parties do it and leaving the people of this country with a great loss of confidence in our entire system. Because the Democrats are beating the hell out of the Republicans and vice versa. The Republicans are beating the heck out of the, the, the Democrats and people are sitting there back saying, I, I don't know who to vote for, I don't like any of these people. What the hell's happened to our country? And that's what all of these questions are about. 
and I, in my judgment, and 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 both of our authors have have indicated, you know, it, it it's systematic, and we have to start examining how we can change this system to get back to the form of a representative democracy that our uh, our founders uh, had envisioned. And until we do that, uh, people are going to continue to lose confidence in this system. I mean, I've seen polls where. Uh, uh, politicians ranked lower than cockroaches and root canals, um, and it was not always that way. But we better take a look, at, as both of our guests have, have written and suggested about the importance of taking a look at this system, because as I said in the beginning, the system can either pull you apart or it can bring you together. And when we served before, the Congress went to Washington, they spent five days a week working on the people's business. Today they go to Washington and spend five days a week raising money to get themselves reelected, and it's a dangerous uh, new uh, way that things are working and it's got to be changed. But thank you for the opportunity to say a few things. Well, thank you. I want to just